this lecture is going to be about stochastic modeling um, and probably the first half of the lecture um, is going to look pretty familiar because um, this is all based around probabilistic simulation and we've done some of that already uh, anytime you've heard me say Monte Carlo simulation or um, randomly sampling from a probability distribution um, that comes into play here um, we're going to go a little bit beyond that um, in this lecture and then certainly in the next one. Um, but we're going to start with some pretty familiar concepts, I think. So again, stochastic modeling um, involves the use of probability and probability distributions to model real-world systems in which uncertainty is present. And that doesn't necessarily mean um, that the systems that we're modeling behave in a random way. Um, sometimes that can be true. Um, in other cases, uh, we may use a stochastic model um, as sort of the best available description of some sort of system. In other words, we may fundamentally know that uh, you know a system is not per se, random, uh, but it behaves in a deterministic way. Um, but we may not be able to um, get into the level of modeling detail required to, to really describe that system. And so um, stochastic modeling can be a way of, I guess you could say, sort of punting, where you want to replicate the behavior of a system, um, even if you don't aren't describing perfectly every little mechanism that's that's causing um, that behavior. And so whether I've um, spelled these four steps out uh, in a neat way or not, um, I, I can't remember if we've if I've been explicit about that, but I think we've gone through all four of these. Um, at some point in the semester, maybe over several lectures. Um, but because uh, stochastic models are inherently probabilistic, um, the first uh, step here is to identify the sample space. And all that means is um, if you're looking to describe or simulate some sort of underlying process, you want to know what the possible values that that process could take. And then step two is assigning probabilities to each element of that sample space. Um, and so by then you have some sort of um, distribution in mind. Uh, and then number three, you want to identify the events of interest. Um, you don't have to. I mean, um, you could get to one and two and then just simulate the system behavior um, assuming some sort of underlying probability distribution, and maybe that's all you want to do. Usually, you know, there, there's a, it, this whole process is a little more goal-oriented, um, where we're worried about the probability of extreme events, um, not always. And then for number four, once we've identified what those events of interest are to us, we can try to figure out the probability that they occur. So again, the sample space is just the, the, the discrete values, and not necessarily discrete, I guess it could be continuous. But the number of, in this case, it's all discrete. Um, all the possible values of whatever underlying process you're studying. Uh, so, for example, every individual card in a deck of cards. Um, or if you're rolling a pair of dice, um, you, every possible combination of two dice values, right? And in the case of the cards, um, we have 52 distinct values, uh, 52 distinct combinations of color and suit. Um, if you're rolling at the dice, there's some possibility for redundancy, right? Um, there's multiple chances to get, a, to get um, the sum of two six-sided dice to be five, and there's the greatest possibility that you have um, the sum of two-sided dice or two six-sided dice equal the value seven. Um, 
And so this is a, this is a little different than um, just sort of this uniform distribution of, of drawing a card from a deck. And if we have um, empirical data, like if we were looking at um, a, a histogram shown here of historical electricity price or electricity um, demand, um, then this is our initial sample space, right? We can uh, figure out every possible value that, in this case, electricity peak electricity demand in July could take. Um, and this might be gleaned from, um, you know, a historical record collected by Duke Energy or PJM or somebody. Um, and really our sample space, in this case, are the bounds of this distribution, the minimum value we we're going to assume and the maximum value we're going to assume. Um, and we assume that everything in between is then possible. So the second step here is assigning probabilities. In the case of the deck of cards, this is a sort of a uniform distribution, I guess you'd say. Um, there's an equal 1 in 52 probability of, of drawing any one card from, from a deck. Um, in the case of um, rolling two dice, that's not the case, right? Um, there are a number of distinct values you can get, ranging from 2 up to 12, right? You, you can't get a 1, you can't get a 13 by rolling two dice. You can get anything in between 2 and 12. But those values, the probability of getting any combination or any of those numbers from 2 to 12 vary. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, the, the most likely outcome uh, is that you get a 7. And so the probability of getting a 7 by rolling two dice um, is equivalent to counting up the number of instances that you have 7 in this square and dividing by the total number of possible values here. So it would be 6 divided by 36, so a 1 in 6 chance of getting a 7 by rolling two dice. And if we want to assign probabilities here, um, there's a couple ways of doing that. Um, we can use a histogram uh, to calculate probability. So if, we're, if we know how many um, possible values are represented here in this histogram, for example, let's say there's um, we have a thousand data points, a thousand um, data points of peak electricity demand in July. Um, and so each of these um, bars represents uh, a collection, right, there, this, these are in bins. So uh, each bar represents the population of a certain bin, for example, uh, in, the, in the first case. Um, that bar represents all instances of peak electricity demand being between um, 7,900 and, and 8,100. Um, and there are 41 or 47 instances of that. And so we can estimate that the probability um, of having electricity demand uh, in, in July, peak electricity demand in July, between those two numbers being about 4.7%. Um, and we can look at a uh, higher demand situation. So what's the probability that electricity demand, peak electricity demand in, in a July day is between um, 9,900 and 10,100. It's a much lower probability, which we calculate directly from the frequency um, on the y-axis divided by 1,000, so the number, total number of data points represented. So in the case of having data that's already um, organized into a frequency histogram, the, the best next step um, would be to convert the empirical data to a probability distribution, so a continuous function, um, so that we can describe the data in terms of its statistical moments, like mean and variance, and then resample synthetic data, or, or randomly sample from that probability distribution with known uh, parameters. And so um, we earlier in the semester went through, um, there was a video that I, I wanted you to watch about 
the, the formal way that you go about fitting probability distributions to empirical data like frequency histograms. Um, and the, a common, the, the most common way of doing that is through maximum likelihood estimation. Um, and so this finds the most plausible fit to of a probability distribution and estimates the associated parameters given uh, some empirical data. Uh, and so you can rewatch this if you're curious about how that happens. Um, this is not something you would ever have to do by hand. Any sort of statistical package would have um, this built into some sort of probability distribution fitting um, function where you input some empirical data in it and you specify what class of distribution you want, whether it's normal or something else, and it um, fits the, the distribution that you specify to your data and the output would be then your um, the estimates for the, the two parameters in the case of the Gaussian distribution that you want, so the mean and variance. And we might want to, uh, in some cases, transform the data uh, before doing this for a variety of reasons. Um, which we've gone over. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why you want to have your data looking Gaussian, um, whether it's because you're going to input it into some sort of regression or estimate confidence intervals, um, or if you want it to be part of some sort of uh, linear model, um, it probably needs to be uh, Gaussian. And there's a number of ways of doing that, and we've gone, we've sort of talked about one common one, which is log transformation. Um, a lot of uh, economic and environmental data is happens to be log log normally distributed, and so if you see that and you take the log, the natural logarithm of that data, it transforms it into something that's Gaussian. Um, you know, as we saw with the the wind um, modeling, the time series modeling of the wind, sometimes data can be resistant to that, and you have to be a little more creative about how you transform data into uh, Gaussian. Um, uh, and we're not going to go as much into that in this class, but know that um, sometimes it's not as simple as just taking the log transform. So if we use maximum likelihood estimation to fit a probabil probability density function to empirical data, um, then what we're left with are um, parameters that describe a continuous distribution, so a mean and variance um, of some sort of, in this case, Gaussian distribution. Um, and that describes the probability of um, getting certain values of a random variable um, that best fit our observed data. And this leads into uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So this we've, we've talked about before in the case of uh, peak demand forecasting and a couple other, um, you know, with, re with respect to uh, autoregressive models, um, any time where there was sort of a white noise function um, in the model, some, some sort of random un uncertain element that we were assuming was part of the underlying process, we were randomly sampling from that. That was, in effect, Monte Carlo simulation. Um, so this is a method for um, that's used uh, in many, many different sectors uh, for a lot of different applications for exploring more or less the sensitivity of uh, complex systems and, and underlying processes um, by varying the values of parameters within some statistical constraint. Um, so. Uh, you may um, identify that there's some element or variable in the system that you're trying to understand um, that either behaves in a random pro uh, process or um, you're uncertain about what its exact value is, but you can describe that uncertainty using a probability distribution. In other words, um, you know, you have a, an estimate of its mean and um, you know that it's your your best estimate that's most likely, the true value is most likely to be pretty close to the mean and less likely to be farther away from it, but it's possible it would have a lower probability of being further away from the mean that you estimate. Um, and so again, we've already seen a couple of examples of this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through some of the examples that we've already seen before we move on.
So um, let's say, and we've seen this before, we have a regression model. And what we're trying to do is, is um, estimate peak annual electricity demand or load um, for the Duke Energy System. And we've done a lot of hard work in terms of building this regression model from historical data. Um, so Y here is our dependent or response variable. Um, and we have all these X, X, X values, these independent variables that we know are drivers of peak electricity demand. And it could be um, population growth, economic activity, um, the types of, the efficiency of, you know, different types of um, electrical appliances that are, people are using, um, stuff like that. And uh, we know that weather is a, uh, so temperatures, heating or cooling degree days is a big part of this too. Um, and so that would be an X, X value here as well. And so from historical data, we're able to fit the general structure of this model. Uh, and what that means is identifying the correct values of B via ordinary least squares regression. Um, and so if we've identified all the B coefficients, then we can, in theory, put in any value of X in our model, or X is, and our model will give us a, uh, an accurate estimate of what the corresponding Y or, or peak electricity demand would be. So I jumped the gun a little bit on this one. Um, again, these would be examples of dependent variables X's that would go into um, a peak electricity demand model. So in, in a lot of cases, if you're, if you're Duke Energy, um, you know, some of these, some of these X's, some of these variables, independent variables, are uncertain, especially if you're trying to make a prediction way out into the future. If you're talking about what economic growth is going to be, or even electricity demand, or, you know, in an average weather year is going to be, um, in five or ten years from now, I, I think there's a lot of uncertainty around those, um, those estimates. But if you're, if you're Duke Energy and you're just trying to predict what peak electricity demand is going to be next year, you might feel comfortable with, um, you know, leaving, making your estimates about economic growth, calendar effects like Super Bowl Sunday and crisp, people using Christmas lights and how they behave on Fourth of July and stuff like that, as well as end-use trends about what types of technologies people are using in their homes. You might feel pretty good about having those as constant values in your model, um, at least the X values. You might be able to say, okay, there's no uncertainty about what economic growth is going to be next year or what, you know, how much energy efficiency people are going to be adopting. Um, but on a year-to-year -year basis, what probably, in terms of electricity demand, creates the most uncertainty is weather. Um, on a year-to-year -year basis, this is equivalent to rolling the dice. Um, and so the X value here that describes weather, whether we're, we put that in terms of heating or cooling degree days, we are fundamentally going to assume is uncertain. And if we can um, describe the probability of different X values here using a probability density function, then we can, we can come up with a lot of different possible values of Y, a probabilistic understanding of Y using Monte Carlo simulation to generate lots of different values of this X5 that describes weather. And so that's what this would look like. You'd have the same regression model. All the B coefficients have already been fitted. Right? You've done that um, just by fitting the model to historical data. And then what you want to come up with is a probability distribution of X. Um, and for example, that could be normalized dry bulb temperature in December or uh, temperatures in, in summer or something like that. And you want to fit a probability distribution to pos those possible values, again, probably using historical information via maximum likelihood estimation.
and then you just want to randomly sample with, re with replacement um, to get any number of possible future values for x5 that you can plug into this regression model. So another, um, another, and this should be a little more familiar um, at this point, another common task for, for Monte Carlo simulation um, is embedding that type of uncertainty, that dynamic uncertainty in, in simulations um, and, and to alter model parameters with some statistical uncertainty on a um, period by period basis and, and so I'll, I'll use an example here that we went over in the last lecture uh, remember there was a model that, a type of class of models that I presented that's also often used to simulate different types of commodity prices including natural gas prices this Ornstein Uhlenbeck model um, and we can describe this as a, as a continuous process using derivatives or a discrete process where the time steps are separable. Um, and remember the key features of this was this mean reverting drift. Um, so the model, um, what this does is it's, it's the, the fundamental, the underlying process that it's modeling um, or describing is the period to period change in this variable XT, which could be natural gas prices. And what the model is saying is that the change from period to period depends on the current value, um, xt, of the price and the relative difference um, between that and the, the assumed sort of global equilibrium, the, the mean value that prices take in the long run. And so if the price in the current period, uh, xt, is a lot bigger than the mean, mu, um, then this middle part um, uh, of, this, of this equation um, becomes negative. And so that builds into the, the, in the value of the, the change in xt, a negative value that forces the model to go back towards the assumed mean. Um, where Monte Carlo analysis comes in um, is this random walk or wiener process. So in the continuous form of the model, you have this derivative of, of WT, where WT is a random walk. Remember, a random walk is where you have a lag one autoregressive process, where it's a process that you can describe completely um, based on what the value was in the last period, plus some, some random sample from a Gaussian distribution uh, or a normal distribution. Um, and so when we discretize this ornstein uhlenbeck model at the bottom, taking the derivative of a random walk is just the same thing as randomly sampling from a normal probability distribution. Um, and so this ornstein uhlenbeck model then means we have some sort of um, mean reverting drift. So um, you know, the, the model's going above the mean, and then it goes, goes above the mean for a little while, and then eventually gets forced down, um, combined with this random sort of noise or, or uncertainty in the system that we described by Monte Carlo simulation, we're just randomly sampling from this probability distribution. So a couple useful concepts when doing Monte Carlo sampling, um, which we may or may not really get into. The first is the law of large numbers. Um, and I, we've, we looked at this a little bit within the context of renewable energy planning. Um, remember that um, there's this uh, pretty well understood phenomenon that um, grouping lots of different renewable energy projects together ends up when you add them together uh, all the cumulative sum of the production from a bunch of different wind farms or solar farms. The product is something that is less variable and potentially more predictable. Um, uh, because if you're just looking at, you know, one wind farm, um, then there's a lot of, there's a lot of noise, right? There's a lot of variability. Um, but if you're taking the output from a bunch of different wind farms, eventually uh, you get to a much more stable, predictable, expected value. 
Um, and that's sort of similar to the law of large numbers. Um, the law of large numbers is this law um, that suggests that the average of results obtained from a large number of trials, and it's not exactly the same thing as like building a lot of wind farms, but rolling a bunch of dice. If you roll a dice um, a thousand times and you're just taking the average of um, all your different rolls, um, eventually that average is going to um, uh, is going to sort of converge uh, to to the expected value, right? The the arithmetic expected value of what the um, what what a roll of the dice would give you that you can just calculate, you know, on paper. And that's what this illustrates. Um, so you have the average value from a certain number of trials, and each trial is a roll of the dice on the y-axis, and on the x-axis you have the number of trials. Um, and you can see that um, if you're if you're rolling rolling the dice one time, um, the mean value, or you know, just a handful of times, the mean of all those trials can be pretty volatile and, and somewhat like just contingent on, on luck, right? Like uh, you could equally see that this um, average starts out above above the, the theoretical mean of 3.5, right? It could start out above and then collapse down to 3.5. But once you get out to um, about 200 trials, things really stabilize. And then when you get out to about 400, they're not only stable, but they're right at this theoretical mean. And so one thing to think about is how, um, what this sort of implies about sample size and the stability of, a, you know, the long-term average. So if you're taking a Monte Carlo sample um, and you want a pretty robust understanding of what the system is going to be, so like if you wanted to take a random sample um, and then calculate the, the mean of, of all the different random samples, um, you can see that there's some variability in those means, right? Like if you, if you did a hundred trials a hundred times, each of those hundred trials would give you probably a, a pretty significant mean and you would, you would even like use a probability dist distribution to describe those, those that distribution of the means, um, but if you if you t did a, a hundred different uh, samples um, of eight hundred rolls of the dice, um, then you know you're going to get a much more stable um, uh, or or much less variable estimate of what the mean of the process would be, and I. I think that's probably trivial to do with rolling dice, but keep in mind that, um, you know, what we're often using Monte Carlo sampling to do is to understand some sort of external system that we don't know much, much about. And so, um, you know, that's important to understand that, you know, how long you run the simulation, how many trials you're going to use does inform what the, what the conclusions you make um, are about, about the system you're studying. So another um, useful concept is the central limit limit theorem. And so this is kind of neat. Um, this basically states that um, the arithmetic mean of, of a sufficiently large number of, of, of samples of, of independent random variables, um, as long as you can define each of those independent variables um, based on their, you know, Expect, expected value and variance uh, will be a, will be approximately normally distributed, right? Even if even if each of these individual variables um, is not themselves um, normally distributed, when you're taking the mean of the outcome of a bunch of these different uh, variables, even if they're all log normally distributed or some you know di distributed according to some other more like exotic distribution, when you're taking the mean of them, uh, eventually that mean will look normally distributed. 
so here's an example of that. Um, this is another rolling the dice, uh, another rolling the dice problem. So when you're rolling one dice, um, the probability distribution uh, for getting any one particular value, one, two, three, four, five, or six, we would describe as a uniform distribution, which means um, it's what we what's shown here in, in dark blue, where you have an equal probability of getting any value of, of the dice. Um, and so if, uh, if we roll two dice, and if you roll two dice, think back to that, that square with all the numbers uh, on it. Um, then the, the mean value uh, that's, that you're going to get is, is no longer uniformly distributed. Remember, because you know, you're, you're most likely to get a 7. Um, and then after that, an 8 or a 6. Um, and you're least likely to get a 2 or a 12, right? Because you'd have to get two ones to get a 2, and that's really rare. And you have to get two sixes to get a 12. And so, um, gradually, as we add more dice here, and we describe the probability of getting certain values associated with uh, rolling more and more dice, um, then... The, the distribution of those values starts to look Gaussian. And you can look um, how it evolves from uh, blue, green, uh, gold, red to purple. The more dice you add, um, the more this starts to look like something we immediately recognize as Gaussian. But recall that the, the individual distribution, each one of these dice, the probability of distribution of getting a value is a uniform distribution, so it's not Gaussian. But adding up all these together does give you uh, uh, a Gaussian Gaussian data. So this, uh, I think, we probably alluded to, um, not me specifically, but was in uh, maybe some of your Khan Academy videos or YouTube videos that that we watched earlier in the semester. Um, and this is super important, um, you know, especially if you're talking about complex systems um, where you, you, you're not really just worried about one variable, you might be worried about three or four, um, and you cannot treat each of those variables as independent, right? Um, so, if we had two variables, for example, and they were completely independent, which means the value of one has no effect on the value of the other, statistically, then we can just fit individual probability distributions to each variable like we've talked about so far, and then just randomly sample them separately, right, and combine their values together, or have them both be separate inputs into the same system, like electricity demand and natural gas prices or something like that. The reality is that a lot of times, um, variables like that, including electricity demand and natural gas prices, are not independent statistically, which means that you know, electricity demand tends to be related uh, to what the price of natural gas is, or vice versa. And so we have to account for that covariance when we are uh, doing stochastic modeling involving uh, random variables that are not independent. And we do that using joint probability distributions. So this is an example of, of two Gaussian distributions, one's red uh, and, and one's blue. Um, and these are what, when you sort of randomly sample um, from, from these two distributions, um, if they have a certain amount of um, covariance, then there will be sort of a two-dimensional pattern. And so you can look at this plane of samples, so all the dots on this plane um, are, uh, you, know, you can even look at it as a, as a coordinate system, right, where you have um, values of the blue variable on one axis and values of the red variable on, on the other axis. And if these were um, 
completely independent, then there would be no recognizable pattern uh, on this plane that's circled in green here. Um, and the way it looks right now, you may sort of think that there's no recognizable pattern. But if you look at the way the green ellipse um, is, uh, is, uh, is oriented, it's sort of at a diagonal, right? So it's sort of reaching from the negative 5 to the 5. It's not just this uniform like shotgun blast. So what that kind of suggests is that you're more likely to have a positive 5 blue and a positive 5 red um, than you are to have a positive 5 blue and um, a, a negative 5 red. Um, if that makes sense. Well, right, I think that makes sense. I, there, there'll be another, there'll be a better picture of this coming up. Not this picture. So this is a three-dimensional um, view of uh, a um, of a multivariate normal distribution. So this is bivariate. So we have an X and a Y. Um, and then on the y or the z-axis, we have the probability um, of that these uh, um, the probability of any combination of x and y. So here's what I was talking about. So this is sort of how you would view the data that was in that green um, green ellipse. So this is you know think about on the y-axis here being, you know, the red distribution, right? And on the, on the x-axis here, the, the, the blue distribution. Um, and, you know, you might be able to describe um, the value of x as this symmetrical, you know, Gaussian distribution. And likewise, you could, you could describe the, the distribution of y in the same way. But the distribution of combinations of x and y does show this pattern, right? That um, that the variables x and y tend to be directly related, right? You're more likely to have um, a high value of x and a high value of y, and a um, and a low and a low value of x and a low value of y than you are to have one high and one low, right? Um, and so this is clearly not two independent variables, right? This doesn't look like just this random shotgun blast. They are, they are related. And so we have to account for this covariance um, and fit a specific distribution that incorporates this covariance um, if we're going to randomly sample these two. In other words, it would be a, a real shortcoming of a model if we just fit probability distributions for x and y and then just randomly sample each of them and put them into a model, right? Because it wouldn't accurately capture the probability of getting uh, an x and a y together, which has a very distinct underlying pattern as shown here. Okay, so the last um, thing that we're going to talk about in this lecture is bootstrapping. This is, we're back to time series stuff a little bit. Um, and so this is a little, a little different um, than Monte Carlo sampling, and it's different than the time series modeling we've done so far. It's different than the ornstein uhlenbeck stochastic difference um, equation. Um, so this is um, uh, just another technique at simulating high volume of, uh, of data, coming up with a synthetic time series. Um, so new data that you can input into a model while preserving, um, you know, statistical and time series characteristics of the underlying process or processes that we're interested in, right? If we wanted to um, come up with new data that's different, but basically has the same mean and variance, the same autocorrelation, the same correlations between multiple variables, then time series bootstrapping is one way of doing it.
basically what you're doing is if you, and this is mostly only a viable option, if you have a really long historical record, right, a really big data set of, of, da of information that describes the system that you're interested in, basically what you're doing is you're going back in the past, not really, you're not treating the process that you're interested in as a random variable, but you are kind of resampling. You're taking, you sort of imagine uh, a, a really long time series sort of stretching from one side of the screen to the other and, and being able to sort of chop that up into dis discrete sort of chunks and then resample those chunks and maybe mix them in different orders. That's um, sort of equivalent uh, to, to, to what bootstrapping is. Um, but it's not that simple. So imagine if we had this process YT that we're interested in, in, in modeling. And we have, um, we know that uh, an autoregressive 2, lag 2 model, um, describes uh, the, the underlying process particularly well. Uh, right? And so remember what an autoregressive 2 process is. It means that we can describe or predict the value of, of yt based purely on the value of yt minus 1, so the value in the last period, and yt minus 2, so the value in the, in the period before that. Um, and these b's are all coefficients, right? Um, and then we have one more part of this process, which is the white noise um, and it, uh, variable. So this is just... Uh, um, normally distributed error, right? So randomly sampling from uh, some sort of normal distribution um, at the end here. And so we could fit this model structure uh, to our historical data, and what that means would be trying to identify the particular values of the Bs here that make um, this model replicate historical data the best. And so if we can come up with um, a good model for this, we can actually subtract it um, from the model that we um, the model that we do have or the data that we do have. Um, and what would be left over um, would be the residuals, right? The sort of the white noise residuals. So the way this works is you would subtract the estimated model, um, which is the BO, B1, YT minus 1, and B2, YT, YT minus 2, from your observed observations. So the observed ob observations here is the, is the Y hat. Um, and so you're subtracting from your observed observations all the est basically the estimates um, based on the best fit of this autoregressive model, um, and what you're left with are the residuals in the that would that your would be part of the autoregressive model, right? So this is sort of the noise, um, the error, however you want to describe it, and this would be probabilistic. Um, this would be something you could describe using. Um, a Gaussian distribution, right? And so you can sort of see that the bottom left figure here would be what our residuals would be, right? So uh, not true white noise because it does look kind of autocorrelated here, right? Um, it's um, it, it does look like maybe it's a lag uh, one or two process here. Um, so if these residuals are themselves autocorrelated, um, then we can um, block sample some of these observations, uh, like take 10 consecutive time periods in a row, um, and then plug them into our the, the fitted R2 model to arrive at a new time series. Um, and so I, I kind of show that visually here where you're, you're taking this time series of the residuals and chopping it up into little blocks that are 10 periods long. And then you're taking those blocks of noise, right? The, the residuals are just kind of like random. No, it's not 
true, truly random because it's autocorrelated. Um, but we are are taking the blocks because we want to preserve that autocorrelation that's in the residuals, and we're taking ten periods of this autocorrelated residual noise and plugging those back into our auto our our, um, our our AR model, the AR two model. And then so we're sort of reshuffling the residuals, putting them back in the model, and then we end up with a process at the right um, of resampled 10-period um, residual noise. And then that whole thing can be put back into the autoaggressive model, and we could have, and then that's a way of getting um, a new synthetic time series. Um, in other cases, um, we may not start out with uh, a, a time series structure. Uh, we, so in other words, we might not um, end up subtracting a, a, like a, a fitted model from our observed data to get residuals and do bootstrapping on the residuals. We might just resample the blocks of the original time series. So what that would involve, just if you had... Uh, and this looks like daily peak electricity demand for the ERCOT system, which is most of Texas. Um, if you had, you know, annual, you would chop this up into annual blocks, basically. Um, and then you could reshuffle the order of these in any order you want to come up with, um, you know, a, a synthetic time series that doesn't look exactly like the old one. Um but it maintains a lot of it the same statistical and time series characteristics. Now, I have this note at the bottom of this slide. It says, you know, think about what a potential downside to, to block bootstrapping is. Um, and I think, you know, you should be able to sort of articulate this based off of our discussion of time series analysis. We talked about the different ways you describe time series and whether something is stationary or non-stationary. So a fundamental assumption of bootstrapping is stationarity. It, it basically assumes that the past or the future is going to look like the past. And depending on the type of system that we're involved in studying, that can be a, a, a pretty fatal assumption. Okay, uh, all done here. Um, uh, here's a, one reference that I found useful in putting this stuff together. Um, I think this was one of the shorter lectures I've done, so um, the next, we're going to do one more um, of a lecture on stochastic modeling. Um, this was, you know, about half of it was review and half of it was new stuff, and, and the next lecture is going to be all new stuff, I think.